1928. In 1928, an English physicist by the name of Paul Dirac hypothesized that electrons can have a negative amount of energy and this led to the discovery of antiparticles. So basically, Paul Dirac combined quantum mechanics and the special theory of relativity and he formulated the relativistic equation of motion of our wave function that describes an electron. And after he solved this relativistic equation of motion, he obtained two solutions. One was positive and one was negative. And instead of getting rid of the negative solution, he said that the negative solution actually corresponds to the proper solution. So both the positive and the negative solution correspond to the correct solution to that relativistic equation equation that became known as the Dirac equation. So basically what that meant is the following. Electrons can not only have a positive energy, they can also have a negative energy value. So if we recall the relationship between relativistic energy and relativistic momentum, we get the following relationship. So the relativistic energy squared is equal to the relativistic momentum squared multiplied by c squared plus m squared squared multiplied by c to the fourth, where c is the speed of light and m is the mass of our particle. Now we see that if we solve for the energy, energy is equal to the positive or the negative square root of this entire quantity. So basically this meant that the energy of our electron is not only positive but it can also take negative value. So let's take a look at the following diagram. We have the y-axis represents the energy. This is our zero line. And remember, electrons can never have an energy of zero. They always have some type of energy. Now before we believed that the energy could only be positive and everything below the lowest possible energy is a vacuum. However, now we know that electrons can not only have the positive energy state, but they can also be found in the vacuum state, meaning they can have a negative amount of energy. So not only do we have a sea of electrons in this region, we also have a sea of electrons within this vacuum state, so our electrons have negative amount of energy. So basically, mc squared corresponds to an electron that is not moving, while negative mc squared corresponds to an electron that is not moving within the vacuum state. So this equation shows that free electrons can be found in two regions. The upper section corresponds to the normal electrons found in the positive region with a positive quantity quantum energy state. Now the lower region however corresponds to the electrons having negative energy and this region is known as the vacuum state because before Dirac's hypothesis we believe this was empty space. It contained a vacuum, no electrons. Now the reason that we don't normally see electrons jumping from this state to the vacuum state is because under normal conditions all these states are completely occupied. They're all filled. Now what about the opposite? Can an electron from this negative energy state actually transition and jump to this positive energy state? Now the difference between this energy and this energy is given by 2mc squared. And the reason that electrons cannot be found within this region is because our p squared can never take a negative value. Because p squared and c squared is always positive, we see that electrons are either found within this region or within this region. 
So, how can we make an electron jump from the vacuum state from negative mc squared to the positive energy state to mc squared? Well, let's take a photon of energy and let's allow that photon of energy to strike the surface of this vacuum state. Now, if the energy of this photon is just right, if it's greater than 2 mc squared, then that electron can gain that photon of energy and transition to this positive energy state. So when that takes place, our electron transitions to this state and it leaves behind an empty spot, a hole. And this empty spot is known as the antiparticle to that electron or the positron. And this positron can now move around in space. So once again, what happens if a photon of light with just the right energy if the photon of light has a great amount of energy than 2 mc squared, strikes an electron with a negative energy state. Well, this electron can now jump or transition to a higher positive energy state from the vacuum region to this positive energy region and that leaves behind an empty spot, so a hole. And this empty spot is known as the antiparticle to that electron or the anti-electron which is commonly known as the positron and this positron can now move around in space. So we have our photon of light which has an energy HF that is greater than 2 mc squared hits our electron. The electron is bumped up to this energy level as shown by this electron and that leaves behind this empty hole. And this empty hole which now has a positive charge and the same exact mass as our electron is known as the positive positron and it can move about space. Now although the positron is actually stable when it exists all by itself, if it actually gets very close to that electron, what happens is that positron and the electron will combine and destroy one another to form a lot of energy in the form of gamma radiation. So it turns out that any time an electron combines with its antiparticle, the positron, they will undergo the, un the annihilation reaction, destroying one another in the process, transforming and or transforming mass into energy. So we have gamma radiation produced. Now it is now believed that every single particle contains its antiparticle. For example, the proton has an antiparticle proton neutrinos have anti neutrinos now the way we symbolize an anti proton is by putting a bar symbol over the p the way we symbolize our anti neutrino is by putting the bar symbol over the v so anytime we use the bar symbol that symbolizes the anti particle to that particle now, the question is, are electrons the only types of particles that can have negative energies? And the answer is no. Other particles can also have negative amounts of energy. So electrons are not the only particles found in the negative energy state, the vacuum state. Other particles are there as well. Now, the question is, how else can our particle jump from the vacuum state to this positive energy state? Is this photon of energy always required for that electron or the particle to jump between the vacuum and the positive energy state? Well, from quantum mechanics and specifically by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we know that energy doesn't have to be conserved as long as the time period over which it is not conserved is very, very small. So by Heisenberg's uncertainty,
uncertainty principle, we see that these particles found in the vacuum state can sometimes jump to the higher energy state even though they don't have enough energy. As long as that jump time interval, the transition time interval is very, very small. And this readily produces the particle antiparticle pair. So whenever a particle jumps from the vacuum state to the positive energy state, it produces the particle, the electron, and it produces the antiparticle, in this case, the anti-electron or the positron. And when, let's say, a proton jumps from the vacuum state, it produces a proton and an antiproton. And finally, let's discuss the concept of antimatter. So we know that matter consists of atoms. Inside the nuclei of atoms, we have protons and neutrons, and around our atom, the nucleus, we have our electrons. So we have the electron cloud. Now, can we actually form antimatter? Antimatter would contain antiatoms, and antiatoms have antiprotons and anti-neutrons inside the nucleus and they have positrons or, or, or anti-electrons orbiting that nucleus and the answer is yes we have actually formed things like anti-helium so anti-helium contains positrons orbiting that nucleus and that nucleus consists of anti-protons and anti-neutrons so material composed of anti-atoms is known as antimatter.